maybe we really actually do need a pen in, in a sense in order to, uh, for some people to actually break out. Hello and welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. Over the last bunch of shows, we've touched upon the idea of a cancel culture that we've been experiencing, not so much directly, but uh, have witnessed uh, in all spheres of uh, societal and political debate. This phenomena of people um, rancorously attacking uh, usually via social media, but in other ways too, anyone who would disagree with them, usually about political issues. And there is such a vehemence, such a uh, an, an almost um, uh, artificial, but certainly pathological uh, element to it, that uh, it it really begs examination, closer examination, I think, because... Uh, it would seem that for anyone who has ever spoken against what is then considered or now considered to be a mainstream or accepted truth, quote unquote, you have a kind of uh, a kind of voice in opposition that doesn't seek merely to address what they disagree with, but to annihilate the speaker. That's what cancel culture is. It's a kind of uh, effort in annihilating the voice or the message that would seek to offer a alternative uh, or differing perspective, no matter how reasonable or how reasonably presented. And on that note, uh, Harrison, you've been writing a little bit on your Substack recently and addressing this uh, issue of cancel culture and actually looking at some of the material um, that we've been discussing in, in past weeks and months uh, regarding uh, esoteric Christian traditions and uh, voices of um, more obscure elements of Christianity and Gnosticism that even centuries ago had detractors that bore more than just a little resemblance to uh, the cancel culture phenomena that that we're um, privy to today. And it was just such an interesting uh, comparison uh, that you made, uh, or an analogy might be a better uh, term for it. This phenomena that that um, that seems to be perennial, that that isn't just uh, something that we've uh, sat up and taken notice to recently, but that seems to have always existed in some form. Uh, so if you would, uh, mention a little bit or a lot about your recent article, uh, cancel culture, uh, 17th century style, 17th century style, uh, that would be, I think a, a good way to launch into this discussion. Well, the thing that, the thing that inspired me to write this article was reading the book that I'd uh, that I've mentioned a couple times in our previous shows, the Wisdom's Children by Arthur Versluis, who we interviewed a month or so or a month or more ago, and he tells the story. Well, part of the way the book is structured is the first chapters each focus on one of the figures of the you know Christian Theosophic tradition. So it starts with Jacob Boma as the kind of progenitor, the first the first one, and then. Johann Gichtel and John Portage, Jane Lead, Johannes Kelpius. So a different different chapter on each of these each of these people and the circles that kind of sprung up around them. And one of the one of the recurring themes throughout, if not all of them, at least a, a good number of them, is the the detractors that they attracted in their lifetimes. So starting with Burma. And because he had he had his vision, his kind of life transforming vision in the year 1600, when he was around, I think around 25, and didn't talk about it for the next decade or so. But he started writing a a book about it called Aurora, 
where he talked about talked about this vision and the the and this transformational effect and how it changed the way he saw the world and understood evil and all of these things. And when it was kind of, I believe, either finished or close to being completed, he had shared around the manuscript of it. And just kind of just with a friend, as he tells it, he'd given it to his friend, kind of with the understanding that it would be kept private. And this friend copied it and shared it around to a bunch of people to to read. And the the local um, pastor pastor yeah what the, I can't remember what the word is for for the Lutheran you know the Lutheran Lutheran church but the yeah the the, the head the head honcho in Gurlitz um, got a hold of it and from that moment on for 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 the rest of both of these men's lives uh, this guy R Richter I believe his name was Richter just hounded Buma for the rest of his life basically um, you know. Um, said sermons about him, slamming him. I think he wrote pamphlets um, and basically told him he can't write books, he can't publish, um, he's a heretic, all of these things, even though the Aurora, you know, as Versluce tells it, you know, wasn't a particularly heretical work, which leaves open some questions as to what, um, what Richter's, um, you know, motivations were, what, what really got his goat, what, what was so insulting about this. So, I mean, we've got some speculations that, uh, Versluis and I go into like that, uh, one of, one of Buma's things was that he was, because as a, as a visionary himself, as a mystic himself, he focused on the, you know, the, the personal, um, the personal experience of the, you know, the individual believer and saw an authority of in that, which is kind of interesting because I, I believe that's part of what the, you know, the, the Protestant Reformation was founded on was to get away from the authority of the church and to to, to focus on a you know a personal relationship with God that wasn't tied to to past authority as in the Catholic Church, but he railed against what he called Babel, and he saw Babel um, as the essentially the mainstream Christianity you know the established churches even in Lutheranism, and that it was kind of like a surface level surface level understanding of Christianity kind of that was rooted in kind of in, in just dogma and as verse Luce puts it, book learning. Like you, you go to school, you read the book, you, you, you understand, you, you, you get taught the, the proper ways of th things to believe and ways of believing. And that becomes your, your personal authority. And he said, well, that, no, that's nonsense. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about the inner, the inner transformation and the, um, the, the inner revelation of, you know, the mysteries of God and creation. And so there might've been a little bit of, um, you know, professional jealousy and, you know, turf protecting, like here's this, this cobbler, this uneducated cobbler, you know, a shoemaker who comes along and, and claims to know the, you know, all the secrets of Christianity. And, but, you know, I'm the, I'm the pastor. I'm the, I'm supposed to be leading this flock. So there might've been a bit of, a bit of that going on. So, but anyways, that was, you know, uh, Buma only lived until he was like 49. I think he died in 1624. And, and Richter died just before then. <clears throat> but for the rest of his life, you know, he didn't publish again. He didn't publish any books for, you know, most of that time period, but he'd been writing. And so by the end of his life, he, um, he published, he started publishing some works. He had a, a book, a collection of, of works called the way to Christ published. And that inspired more attacks from Richter. And then when Richter died, you know, another guy took his place. And this was, this kind of repeated with some of the other theosophers that they kind of acquired their own, you know, obsessive critic who would kind of follow them around, who is who would read everything that they that they wrote and make sure to to comment and criticize on it. So they had this like ob this obsession, this hyperactive obsession with this person. And then, um, like with with Buma, one one goes away and another takes his place. And it just kind of it seemed it it seems like a it seems like there it's an interesting phenomenon that there might be something more to. And so when, when reading these, when after reading this book and kind of, you know, seeing these examples repeat, it reminded me of something that I'd read in an essay that John Keel wrote. 
which was included in his his like kind of like anthology book, a collection of essays that he wrote for, you know, some, some pulp UFO magazine or something like strange tales or something um, called Disneyland of the gods. And he talks about what he calls the Hochstetter effect um, or the Hochstetter syndrome. And he tells a story about this guy in the 1920s named Lester Hendershot, who claims to have invented this kind of, you know, almost like a free energy machine. he, he'd created this motor that he claimed worked on the earth's magnetic field. And so he could do all kinds of times, all kinds of things with it. It was just this small motor and he'd demonstrate it, you know, running various household appliances and things like this. And this guy, Dr. Frederick Hochstetter, um, latched on to Hendershot and same with Boma and Richter, you know, would, um, well, he, I'll just read this. He launched, you know, he launched a bunch of press conferences attacking Hendershot. He wrote pamphlets against him. Um, and his self-stated motive was that may, th that pure science might shine forth untarnished. So we saw Hendershot as this, you know, charlatan who was besmirching the good name of science. And finally, um, Hendershot, when he was giving a demonstration of his, you know, supermotor, um, shocked himself and, you know, he got an electric shock from it and it paralyzed him. And after that, Hochstetter just kind of disappeared from public life. He shut up. He's like, I guess, I guess his mission was complete. He had, he had ensured forevermore that science would be untarnished and that its pure light would, would shine throughout the ages. And, and that was the end of Hochstetter, um, which was kind of interesting, kind of strange. And Kiel gives a whole bunch of, well, not a whole bunch, but he gives several examples of this. You know, if no one knows, John Kiel was a, uh, he was kind of, I, I'd, cal I'd classify him almost as a gonzo journalist, like a Hunter S. Thompson, but he was a, he was at first kind of like an adventure writer. So he'd go traveling, you know, he'd, he'd go to Egypt and, uh, well, he was a, he was a writer since he was like thir 12 or 13 or something. He'd write for, for whatever newspaper he could get into, whether it was a school newspaper or like a, an actual newspaper. So he's always a journalist, a, uh, um, you know, uh, a reporter man. And in early in his career, he would travel all over and to, to new and exciting places and then write, you know, crazy stories about it. Like he went to Egypt, he broadcast, um, when he was in the Navy, I believe, I can't remember. He was part of, you know, some, some branch of the U S military and was stationed in Egypt. And he, he somehow got in, you know, got an agreement to, to stage a broadcast, a radio broadcast from inside the, the great pyramid and just did a bunch of crazy stuff like that. So he wrote, his first book was about his kind of travels in the Orient and, and all the adventures that he had. And then in the late sixties, I think it was like maybe 67, he, got, I believe he got like a commission from Playboy to write an article on UFOs and spent a whole bunch of time writing this article, which was never published because it ended up becoming too long and Playboy lost interest and he ended up just turning it into a book. So from that point on, he kind of um, covered UFOs for years and uh, as well as all kinds of just, you know, strange paranormal stuff, kind of like a, almost like a George Knapp or a, um, you know, who's the guy with the radio program, the, the famous radio oh, program? Art Bell. Yeah, Art Bell, kind of like, a guy kind of like that. And so that's who John Keel was. So one of the examples he gives is from the, the UFO research, um, you know, history and, and field. So first he talks about J. Allen Hynek, who was the kind of the, the, the figurehead of Project Blue Book, the, you know, the original um, U.S. government uh, Air Force investigation into ufos from like the i can't remember when it started it was somewhere in the 50s uh 50s to 60s and Heineck was kind of like he was the the chief debunker for a while as the head of blue book you know writing off um unexplainable sightings as things like swamp gas which kind of made him the laughing stock of um the public as well as more serious scientists that were looking into this like james mcdonald um, but eventually Heineck kind of came around. He either quit, I think he quit Blue Book or was fired. I can't remember, or, you know, just phased out. And he eventually, you know, became, uh, kind of totally changed his, his tack and started writing books, um, you know, that took UFOs seriously as a, as a scientific, you know, research project. 
He was even the the inspiration for the character played by Truffaut in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, or was that Jacques Vallée? Oh, it was Vallée. Yeah, it was yeah. Vallée. Heineck. Something about Heineck. Um, I can't remember. Uh, well, anyways. Um, but uh, Philip, this is where Philip Class enters the, the picture because uh, Philip Class was the editor of an aerospace trade journal. And once Heineck changed his mind, Class, like Boma, or like, uh, like Richter and like um, Hochstetter, latched on to Heineck and would, every chance he get, would, he, he'd read every statement uh, of Heineck and then point, you know, publish a, a rejoinder, a harsh response criticizing everything he said. And uh, so, as, as Kiel puts it, uh, Class spent all his spare time poring over Heineck's statements and public pronouncements. He gleefully pounced on each of Heineck's errors and issued long, well-written attacks. Class first, surf Class first surfaced in March 1966 at a UFO press conference staged by Donald Kehoe, a pulp writer, another early UFO researcher. Um, he heckled Kehoe unmercifully and thus became the chief heckler of the rather trivial UFO field. And in 1987, he was still attending UFO conventions, causing disruptions and heckling the speakers. Um, he did the same thing to Dr. James McDonald, who was a, a widely respected American physicist, uh, uh, American scientist. I believe he was like an atmospheric f physicist or something like that. And this was a guy that kind of like Heineck, well, he, he skipped the debunker stage of Heineck and, and just quick, pretty quickly realized, well, this is actually an interesting scientific problem. Uh, I'm going to look into this and became one of the, you know, one of the, the leading lights of scientific ufology taking the subject seriously and, um, um, you know, not being a, not being a douchebag about it. And so class, la class latched onto him and just harangued him. Um, and McDonald ended up committing suicide. At least that's the official story. Could be, um, he, he, Keel, as Keel points out, he was, you know, depressed and, um, you know, not in the best frame of mind. So it could be that he, that he did commit suicide, but, um, those are just a few examples. And of course you, you could probably go back further and find all kinds of examples. Like when Ilan was introducing the, the topic, he mentioned, you know, Gnosticism <clears throat> for instance. And so you look back at the, at the first Christian dualists, the first Gnostics that were railed against by the church fathers. And you find guys like Tertullian and Irenaeus and these guys, you know, they seem like they could fall into the same category. But uh, at least that's, so that's the kind of the bare bones of the, the kind of dynamic that, were, that I was talking about that, see, that seemed, uh, so I'll put this in context of cancel culture. It seemed more targeted than what we see in a lot of cancel culture. A lot of cancel, cancel culture that takes place online, it is targeted, but it seems it's such a, a widespread thing um, where it's like the, you've got any number of people to choose from to, if you want to, to go after someone, this seemed like, um, what was the, the, the phrase, the, you know, the phrase I used to introduce it. Um, yeah, the, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. So you have a whole bunch of nails, just normal human people. And then one pop pops their head out, you know, or very few, and they're easy targets. They're identifiable targets. Okay, there's the one person taking UFO seriously, for example, right? Well, we can go after them. And with cancel culture, it's kind of, kind of has metastasized to the point where, well, okay, well, there's a large, a, a significant segment of the population that will disagree with the 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 consensus. It might even be the majority of the population disagrees with the consensus, the so-called consensus, but that you know uh, only a, a smaller portion of that segment of the population is willing to say anything about it. So they're the ones that put their heads up. And then you get like a, um, a guy like Michael Rechtenwald, who we interviewed, who sticks, you know, sticks his head up out of the crowd by having an anonymous Twitter account um, where he railed against, you know, PC stuff. And then when he becomes, when he goes public and um, has his, you know, agrees to have his name released to, to be identified in the, you know, the, 
the university newspaper or whatever it was, then the entire faculty kind of goes after him and, or, you know, or a small number of the faculty and then everyone else just kind of goes along with it or doesn't say anything. And so he lost his job, um, or at least, uh, well, listen to the interview with him to get the full story about that. So just, those are just some of the kind of aspects of it, but, um, we could probably get into more detail if you guys want. Uh, what, what, did you guys have any thoughts on that or the whole thing? Well, there seemed to be, I thought it was kind of interesting that, well, (laughs) go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, I thought it was interesting that, um, you know, how, uh, at least generally what seemed to have happened like in times past or in previous times was that there was somebody who was doing something somewhat significant in some kind of, some kind of way, um, that, that actually, uh, I guess warranted in some sense, uh, a detractor coming after them. You know, there was something significant like, uh, Jakob Boma, who was kind of a pioneer, uh, of this new mystic tradition, um, who was kind of bringing this new light into, into the world. Um, and so um, for, for somebody who, or for a world that does not have that as something within its wheelhouse or something that is recognized as being, uh, good or, or something like that, well, then it's like, yeah, this is foreign. This is uh, too obscure. Um, but but it's it's interesting in in the sense that uh, and we can we can use a matrix analogy here for Agent Smith. It's like all of these for these people who do these kinds of good things who are in a, in a sense like neos within a matrix. There are the corresponding Agent Smiths who seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, who have the the right credibility, so to say, to you know butt heads with them, and then you know for the people who uh, want an excuse to dismiss them, they have an excuse to dismiss them, um, and then for the people who are like actually really interested in what they have to say, well then you know that just shows them okay this is something that I should pay attention to, um, but like you're saying that has in our time with access to the internet and so many people um, being able to say, you know, very like humdrum things. uh, Well, now there's a billion people out there who can be triggered for uh, any number of reasons and then can, you know, find their, their corresponding Neos to their agent Smiths. And, and yeah, it just becomes this, this total cesspool of crap. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And well, one one of the interesting things that, uh, well, there's an explanation for this, but one of the things that s- sticks out is that it's always one way, first of all. So, you know, it wouldn't, it's not like Richter or Hochstetter or, yeah, Hochstetter acquired their own, you know, obsessive detractors, right? And I think that's mostly just because they were representing the the mainstream view, right? Um, so they had the entire the entire protection of almost a universal consensus behind them. It is the, you know, the fact that you're going against the grain that opens you up to this kind of, this kind of phenomenon. There's a second thing. And that's that I could be, you know, I could be wrong. There could, there, there could be examples of this, but I don't see this phenomenon. I haven't seen this phenomenon with just to take an example, like flat earthers, right? I haven't seen a particular you know, flat earther proponent that acquires someone that just latches onto them and, and just, uh, you know, obsessively points out all the reasons the world is round. I mean, you do have, you do have debunkers who will it's usually the other way around. <laughs> right. Yeah. See what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> so th- that's, that's, that's interesting too. Um, maybe we can get into that. And, well, yeah, do, do we, that well, might be interesting, an interesting yeah. thing to get into. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's actually, um, a good point, uh, that speaks to something that I, I wanted to mention because I thought, uh, you know, when we, uh, prepared the show and, and said, uh, we're going to do something about cancel culture and all that, I thought, uh, yeah, that, that maybe there's a kind of like an esoteric, uh, 
interesting question in there. And uh, Adam uh, already mentioned the, the matrix analogy and, and things like that. And you just said, you know, like, oh, why, but why do the flat earthers don't have their distractors, right? And um, and one thing that I, that came to mind was also that it seems that this old school dynamic, you know, with Hofstetter and Richter and, and those guys, that it's probably also, it's it's very similar to what we're seeing today, except that, you know, back in the day, it was it was a different world, right? So you didn't have Twitter, you didn't have like this mass thing. And, you know, like even those guys were even interested in theology, it was probably like a very small club, you know, and I mean, you couldn't even like write an open letter or whatever, you know, so so maybe there's also just an, a, a te technology aspect there why it's, it was maybe more one-on-one. Um, but, you know, the interesting question for me is, um, so it seems this cancel culture is not a new phenomenon, right? So it's maybe particularly bad today, uh, arguably, but it's it seems it's not something new. And uh, I did wonder, you know, like, um, what is it that, you know, wh why are certain things canceled you know because these things they they also change right so they it's not that there's a set of rules you know so you can say that and you can't say that and it just is that's it right so it changed um, uh, over history so at some point you know you could couldn't couldn't you know be against this or this war you know like uh, or that you know, political issue of the day. And, you know, like 10 years later might be something different. And, uh, and, and that, isn't that an interesting question? So how, how come, I mean, how, who, who decides, you know, what topics are taboo and, 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 and why? And I think that's kind of like the, the crux of the matter, right? Because it, um, it doesn't seem, I mean, you could argue it's just random, you know, it's just, you know, or, you know, from the progressive perspective, actually, people would argue, oh, it's because we're getting better, right? So back in the days, you could say something bad about homosexuals, you know, uh, and now we just progressed, you know, and we know more. And now that's just not a thing anymore. It's just eternal progress, right? But that, that doesn't really make sense, you know, if you look into history and it's just uh, not, not, a good, not a good argument because it's really keeps changing and there's strange stuff in there like UFOs, you know, what, what the heck, you know, I mean, who cares? <laughs> and, um, and then uh, there's, uh, uh, there's maybe like a, a more secular explanation um, in terms of psychology and phonology and things like that, uh, that, you know, you could say um, maybe it's just this um, pathological people in power, you know, that uh, in positions of power, they want to protect um, their power, build their power networks, and they're just going to, you know, st stamp out like opinions that uh, stand in their way, basically. Um, uh, and I think that's that's probably a very good, um, good take on it, uh, but it still kind of begs the question why certain you know why why certain topics and and not others and uh is it all, always only like power you know i mean there's certainly a big big part of it but um uh but but is it really you know it's it's kind of i mean the 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 whole critical theory thing is is around for for a long time but you know like 20 years ago nobody would bash an eyelid you know if you said you know were maybe a bit critical towards homosexual homosexuals or something so it's 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 kind of it's 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 kind of strange, you know, and 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 then there's obviously like the more uh, like uh, um, gnostic uh, idea or like even like mainstream Christian idea, if you will, of evil and um, and that you know these things are just now put in our way to test us in a sense, you know, because once we uh, we we stray from from the mainstream, we kind of you know get tested or whatever, you know, but. But but all of that, you know, it's like just throwing things out there, right? I mean, I'm, I'm really interested what what you guys think about it. But uh, it seems to me um, there there's there's kind of a, like a mystery there, right? And there's the, the the gnostic idea that we're actually ruled by some evil, you know, evil angels or whatever, and they set up this whole mess. And once we go against them, you know, they will will come after us. I mean, that's uh, that could make sense, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's 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 just um, uh, this this idea, you know, the matrix thing, and um, and it has has 
there, there have been different thinkers who have expressed the same thing, right? I mean, um, uh, that there is some kind of force, you know, that that is mostly invisible, except when you go against it, right? So you really don't notice it, but say say the wrong thing, and suddenly, boom, you know, you you realize that there is some some force there that keeps you on track, and that keeps kind of like history, you know, together, like for whatever purpose. And and it has been expressed, um, for example, I think I mentioned it last time. Uh, uh, Simone Weil, uh, Gravity and Grace. Uh, and she talked about like gravity as this kind of force, right? That keeps us in on, on track. And I think uh, uh, Boris Moraviev uh, called it the general law. Um, and uh, there, yeah, and it's it's interesting that you know, like it has often been like mystics who have come up with with such ideas. I mean, Simone Weil, for example, she's also like kind of a mystic, and she claimed to be somehow somewhat directly in touch with God and things like that. So a bit like like the Theosophers. Um, and uh, so maybe there's a clue there, you know, why uh, that it's like often these kinds of mystics, you know, who, who at least claim to have a direct connection to God and, and, you know, like the communion with the spirit that Paul talked about and, and, uh, and they kind of like, uh, that takes them out of this force in a sense. Right. And they, they, uh, get the inspiration to, you know, break out because it's, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it, otherwise it could be seen as kind of random, right. Um, because, uh, what is it that makes you break out of it? You know, it, it's just not not obvious. You know, I mean, it could be today this and in 10 years something totally different. Yeah? So, yeah, uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, Luke, I, I think you hit on it in a, in a big way when you uh, mentioned the mystics, because what these individuals were saying was not only that that they felt that they found a pathway or connection that was more or less direct to uh, an angelic hierarchy, to a theosophical uh, lineage, to a, a Gnostic a realization, but they were extending their knowledge and their understanding and their experience of this um, feeling or knowledge to other people. Uh, they were basically making this approach uh, or trying to accessible uh, for those people who may have already had an inkling uh, or a, uh, or whose nature was um, leading towards this kind of connection that they can make personally without the intermediary of say, you know, the, the local pastor, uh, the local guy in authority who is assigned by the church to give sermons. And uh, that in itself is, um, uh, it's in a way subversive, but uh, in, a, in a very positive way. It's, you know, it's like Ashworth saying it's the faith of Christ and not the faith in Christ. It's, it's you having that own, uh, your own and owning it, um, uh, taste for the divine uh, or, and and so this is a very uh, revolutionary um, kind of individual uh, transformation that that uh, people like Bohm were saying was quite possible uh, for those who who sense the truth of it. And so I wonder if it's uh, if part of this is um, individuals who just had a taste for truth, be they in the uh, religious sphere or in the, the UFO field or in uh, political circles, it's like this tendency or leaning towards knowing and speaking truth, uh, even if it falls way outside of the accepted norms of a given time and place outside of the authoritarian framework that's being set up for people to follow um is uh th there you know i'll give you an example i mean so right now we're seeing these geopolitical convulsions and and half the world is 
is screaming bloody murder at Russia. And uh, the, the other half, perhaps more, uh, sees a very different perspective of what's going on on, on that scale. And it, it's not enough that the people who would be in sympathy to or understanding of the perspective of, of Russia be disagreed with. They're called Putin apologists. They're, uh, they're accused of all kinds of things in, in the media, demonized. Uh, so there seems to be a, um, uh, and I, I, I really think a lot of them are sincere in their own way. They really do live in another reality. Uh, their thinking, their orientation, their, uh, their vision seems to be oriented in a, in a completely different way. Um, and, and so they live in different worlds. And, um, so I, I wonder if there is some connection, maybe it's just truth, a taste for truth and speaking truth and wanting to know truth. Uh, that seems to be the one commonality among uh, the people who tend to get canceled uh, in whatever era or um, milieu that we're seeing cancel culture exist. <clears throat> well, I think that's, I think that's a big part of it. We have to get down into some more details to, to refine it because it could, you could look at someone like uh you know, a Copernicus or something, um, someone who introduces a, a change, uh, a new truth that, and, and who is persecuted for it, which then becomes common knowledge. And so, you know, no one's, no one's going to be persecuted today for saying the same things that an early, you know, martyr was accused, w was persecuted for. So there's still got to be an aspect of the, the, the hidden truth or the truth that is, that is not widely accepted um, for that, you know, there has to be that valence to it, that, that difference from the, from the common, uh, the common belief. And well, the, the theosophers had an explanation for it. It was that kind of like Luke was saying is that th this force that exists, well, the theosophers called it the spiritus mundi or the, the spirit of the world, which is the prince of this world which is Satan. <laughs> so, so basically the, the world is, you know, in the control of the, of the devil and, and demons. And when you, when you share ideas and uh, on es essentially how to escape the, the grasp of, of the devil and to, to escape the influence of the spirit of the world that, uh, that influences your, you know, your, how you think, feel and behave at, you know, at any given moment, um, then that just like in the matrix, that's a threat to the, to the existence of the existing system. And so of course that's, that's directly related to that taste for things that are true, but it's a specific type of truth that, uh, that deals with the, um, um, you know, the, the unseen, maybe. The, yeah. The unseen, the, the, a, a hidden reality, um, a hidden, a hidden truth that isn't a, that isn't widely accepted because it can't be widely accepted because um, if it were, then, you know, reality as we know, it would be completely different, um, I suppose. So there's almost like it's, yeah, you run up against, against the barriers. Like here, here are the barriers of, of our, of our reality and anything that crosses it, that brushes up against those barriers will, you know, it's like an electric fence. It's like you're gonna you're gonna get shocked when you get too close to those to those barriers, and it was just interesting that the the three examples that we brought up, you know, had to do with okay, so this mysticism, so you know, crossing the some kind of veil um, between you know the conscious and the unconscious, between the material and the and the spiritual, or however you want to think about it, and then we had free energy and we had UFOs, <laughs> so. <laughs> All, all three things that, uh, you know, may have something in common, you know, who knows? Um, we'll have to wait for the, the new, the new NASA investigation to, to get to the bottom of it and uh, tell us the truth about if these things are related or not. But, the new NASA investigation was, into the reality into, into of UFOs. UFOs. Yeah. 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 They just announced their, there was the, 
Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to wait and see on that then. Um, but there was the, and so like t talking about those like three examples that you, that we that you brought up, um, where they do have this like piercing of the veil aspect to it, uh, seeing beyond uh, what is seen with the eye, seeing the unseen. The the those kinds of things are. Um, what I what I want to point out is the distinction I think between um, what we were talking about before with cancel culture and the kinds of things we see there versus what we see with those kinds of individuals, like like Keel pointed out, where um, these people were they basically ate, li lived, and breathed what these people that they were detracting. They basically like <coughs> I don't know how to describe it other than like. Um, you know, they became obsessed. Like, like I think you wrote in your article, where um, the people were obsessed with a particular idea, the detractors became obsessed with those people. And interestingly enough, once once those people with the idea uh, either quit or died or left or whatever, um, then those people that were detracting fell away. There was nothing really in them uh, beyond just tearing somebody else down. They, they didn't go on to live these super influential lives of any sort. They didn't create anything of super lasting value. There was, there was, they were just empty shells of, of the demons. Um, and, and so taking, taking the, that distinction that I just brought up and then giving it a specific example, I'm thinking about, um, Harry Potter, uh, what's her name? J.K. Rowling. J. Rowling. Uh, J. Rowling. J.K. Rowling. J. Yeah, where she is saying things that quite a few people do not like. That where she is defending women's rights, saying, "I am a physical woman, and I don't feel safe when someone who thinks, who says that they're a man, but has a penis and can rape me, wants to invade my space. That's not okay with me." And that's. You know, that's something that she's come out and said, and she has been attacked viciously for it. But there's a difference between like a dog pile and, and this other um, detractor that we were talking about before, at least so far as I'm aware. I don't know of anybody who's like gone through and read all of jk rawlings posts and everything like that like i'm sure that they've probably read it, you know harry potter and watched all the movies and probably read tons of stuff or whatever but i don't see them as being so obsessed with with her in that kind of way but then again maybe it's just because i i don't know well an um, example that but, i mean an example that kind of there? approaches that would be a guy like andy no because there are people that are obsessed with Andy No, and like you know, they whenever they think they've spotted him on the street, they you know they've got their yeah. either Twitter or their 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 apps where they can post their sightings of Andy No, so that they can get their you know their their buddies to come by and try to beat him up. Um, he, he's a Andy No, a big a big uh, investigator of Antifa. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's that. There's almost like a an organized aspect to it. It's it's almost like uh you could say that there's the pure phenomenon, the Hochstetter syndrome, and then there's the you know weaponized Hochstetter, um, you know, uh, modality or something where it becomes where they've you know they actually talk about it and they they coordinate and and it's like okay this is what this is one yeah, of our targets we're going to go after him. Yeah, what comes to mind also is like some of those Wikipedia trolls, um, you know, these uh, groups that I think they were like a big new new a atheism uh, group or something, you know, that went through Wikipedia and like dissed God, you know, <laughs> like wherever they found him, something like that. <laughs> and uh, and also that there was a um, uh, like a big, I think that's a few years back, um, I think there was even an article uh, called Wikipedia, We Have a Problem. It's kind of like a famous um, article. People should look it up. It's really fascinating. It's it's pre pretty old, uh, but uh, it's like um, like kind of like an in investigation into like the dynamics um, behind like the Wikipedia like editors and stuff. And it's it's really crazy. And there was one particular um, group 
on their um they kind of coordinated and they went after like all alternative health stuff on on wikipedia right and just uh dis dismissed everything you know that wasn't like total 100 percent like uh official mainstream medicine uh as total quackery you know like things like homeopathy and like all kinds of stuff and they just cleansed the whole thing and those guys were obsessed you know i mean when whenever like there was like some hint of some like you know <laughs> treatment that you know people couldn't like uh i don't know like pr produced by uh, by big pharma or whatever you know they would just freak out and like this the whole thing and uh and and yeah that, that's actually kind of interesting that these dynamic uh these days seems almost to be like a bit a little bit crowdsourced right <coughs> so you you have the um i'm sure there are some like super hardcore like you know uh, jordan peterson haters you know who just go after him and read everything just to to diss him but it, you get the f vibe that these kind of things today m are more like you know it's probably like a few dozen of of them or that kind of like coordinate or something like so that so maybe then the maybe then it's uh you, we can bring out the demons again uh and so like maybe before like a, a demon would only attack one person but now uh thanks to the internet they're able to infect <laughs> and whole a whole army and so it's the demon swarms are out to get you <laughs> well it's kind of like a field or theater of battle right where the theater of battle you know you have some ballistic missiles you have soldiers on the ground with automatic weapons you have uh you know, technology that's going to cut communication. You have all kinds of approaches, uh, or, and the weaponization of, of people and their words and their voices to suppress, uh, what, what may be disagreeable in, in their point of view. So, uh, yes, it, it's, it's kind of demonic. Uh, if you're going with the assumption that the truth is being suppressed um, and that individuals are uh, being uh, motivated somehow through themselves, uh, by others, through the media, through messaging to attack um, and not just attack, but to do so in such a over the top and damaging way quite often. Um, and that, that speaks to another piece that you recently, uh, wrote about Harrison, about the transgendered fella in relationship with a woman he was married to for 15 years and how he was disintegrating into, uh, his, his new, uh, gender identity and disintegrated to such a degree that when he was interacting with individuals, I, I found this really compelling when he was interacting with individuals in social media, it, it got to where this, you know, somewhat benign, you know, lefty, lazy, uh, husband, uh, character who, who decided he was going to embrace his new gender identity was actually, uh, threatening. Uh, with violence, people he was interacting with on the web, he had he had allowed himself to become this uh, this voice, this instrument of um, uh, attack attack, yeah, on a mundane level, but viciousness. Um, so that that would seem to exist at its extreme end of of cancel culture, and. Uh, and it, it's just interesting to, to note how this individual, I mean, there was a progression. Um, you know, he fell into this political ideology, this, this dysphoria, and uh, it meant a dissolution of his marriage. Um, but, and, and demanding that he be identified as a woman, even though he looked like a, a parody of a woman. Maybe you can explain this a little better or share any insights you have into what happened with this individual, because, um, you know, it, it, that there was this, this kind of mundaneness to it that turned into something, uh, semi-demonic 
to, to mm. for lack of a better expression. Yeah. Well, it, it sounded like a, a pretty, a, pit, a pretty typical transition. Um, uh, you know, no pun intended, <laughs> but, uh, the, you from know, human so, to demon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, to give a little bit of the background. So the way that this is, this was based on a, a review of a memoir by this woman who was married to this guy. And so you know, the story of their, of their marriage and, uh, and, uh, it's a uh, dissolution. So started out just as a rel- relatively normal, you know, normal couple, loving couple, no children. Um, this guy, you know, had some, had some, uh, if not, well, he didn't, he didn't start out with sexual fetishes. They seem to have a, um, a, a, a relatively normal sex life, but you know, with, you know, um, watching porn, including his, you know, his, you know, how did you put it? Like favorite porn um, genres or something. So who knows what was going on there? I didn't read the book. I don't know if the if that was revealed in there. But then he started his <clears throat> his sexuality became more and more fetishistic as time went on. So then he wanted to to you know to take the role of a woman and and be dressed up as a woman and and et cetera et cetera to the point where you know he he identified as transgender and transition it to, um, to being a woman and then rewrote his history as if he had always been like that. So it wasn't that he had a a sexual fetish. Now it was, no, I was just, I was always transgender. This was just, I was just kind of, you know, testing and, and to, 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 to see if it was safe for me to, to, to kind of express my true self. And so there was kind of a, a, a re an inner rewriting of history that went along with it. And then like Elon said, the, he started a blog and, um, kind of, you know, attacking people online and just kind of a, a, a yeah, a disintegration, a, a fall into somewhere, somewhere that he wasn't at beforehand. And the, at least the way his wife tells it, you know, they, they were at least, you know, a relatively normal couple beforehand, but he turned into someone who's completely different as time went on. And so I don't know what, what else to, if you were looking for anything else besides that kind of background. Well, it, it just seemed uh, interesting to me that he, he had no breaks. Uh, it was no um, breaks in, in terms of his descent. Um, oh. that, you know, at, uh, I didn't read the book either. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, he became cancel culture, uh, mm-hmm. through his narcissism, through his, uh, I, I am become cancel culture uh, un- unwillingness, I think to, <laughs> to question more deeply what he was undergoing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and the way, the way I put it in the article, I think was it, it's like he adopted the a template. Um, and that's what seems to happen is that there, there's almost like this, this template that, that, you know, you won't be in the template. And then once you kind of assent to becoming part of the template, then you become conformed to that template. So he became the caricature of, you know, this type, this cancel culture type. So all of the features you could, you could check off all of the features that, uh, that come along with that template. And it's, 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 it's weird. It's kind of, it's this uncanny thing where someone will just, you know, <laughs> become this other person that is, that has all of you, that you could just take the list of features that they have and um, they become carbon cutouts of each other. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think that part of this cancel culture f- phenomenon, it has to do with the, uh, just with you know so society basically or like the let's say the the knowledge space or the mind space of a given society in a given period of history right so there's just this um this weird you know um thing i i i wrote about that in in one of my artic- latest articles i think um it's like um plato uh, talked about it in terms of the great beast and it was kind of like an analogy for society. And uh, it's basically like people tend to um, uh, look as some, at something as good, you know, if the beast uh, basically rewards you or like does what you want or, you know, something like that. So if, you, if, if an action is basically good, you know, if it, 
if society kind of like agrees with it, right? Or like the, 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 the given mind space, you know, at the given time agrees with it. And it is, is bad, you know, if there's some pushback, basically. So that's basically like the, the common, you know, like morality, if you will, uh, that, that people work under, even though they probably will deny it, you know, but it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's, you can kind of like see that, that this is what's going on, you know, because sometimes values change, you know, very quickly <laughs> as we have seen, um, uh, lately. And, 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 you know, suddenly like it's every, you know, like it's as if, you know, the previous values hadn't, hadn't existed. So there, there seems to be some truth to it, you know, that, uh, it good is basically what, what, um, what makes the beast happy. And, uh, and with these micro things, like with the trans story, you know, it's like almost these days, um, it's, it's kind of like there, it's not just one great beast, you know, like there's like different, different, different little beasts, you know, if you will. And you can like, uh, associate with, with, with one of them, you know, like, and, uh, and especially online, you know, like, so you, people kind of get sucked into this, this, this world, you know, if they kind of resonate with it to begin with, and then they suddenly like, it's like almost like a download, you know, so you the, the, <laughs> You just adopt this particular like mind space, and 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 that's it. And uh, and I think that's maybe a, a, the you know the the connection to cancel culture is that um, because I'm still kind of like thinking about like who what defines these kinds of rules. But uh, at the end of the day, it's it seems it's probably really just what um, what the given like sub society or society at large. Um, uh, defines at a, at a given time and, and it's, it's, it's very unconscious, right? I mean, cause the, it's just this common pool of knowledge, you know, it's like everybody knows, you know, this or that. And if you say something against it, then, oh, you are bad, you know, it's just, you know, like, like with Plato's great beast, you know, you're bad because, you know, it's just the beast reacts badly, you know, it's, uh, that, that seems to be kind, kind of it, but, but it's interesting that it seems to be more splintered these days. I mean, back in the days, you know, you had maybe different nations, you know, where, where there were different rules and things. And I mean, in, during the Nazi time, for example, like the, the, the mind space in Germany was very different than, you know, in the, in, in the U S or whatever. So, but, but these days it's like, it's like super splinter. You can like download mi micro programs, so, so to speak, in a sense. But well, also, yeah. I mean, society at large also um, uh, accepts it, right? I mean, if if society at large were like totally <coughs> anti-trans, you know, I mean that 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 wouldn't work, right? Yeah, maybe I would say. Well, I think during earlier in our talk today, you. I think it was you mentioned this idea. Well, does power have to do with it? Like, is it just power or, um, or control? Uh, or maybe it was you alone. I can't remember which, which of you was talking about that, but I, the way I see it, 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 it seems, it seems like almost like a, a turf war or a, you know, a battle to, to protect one's held territory because you, you brought up the example of the alternative health editors, you know, on like on Wikipedia where, anything alternative health they'll just go after and it's not it's not just on wikipedia i mean it's just it's a common a common thing everywhere right where they'll just um anything alternative even if it's just like you know a, a simple uh a simple medication or something like i don't know like iodine or or something like something that that like you said can't be monetized by a pharmaceutical company um will just be relentlessly attacked and so in in that example, you can almost hypothesize that it's an organized, uh, you know, an organized campaign by these companies, or at least inspired by these companies, in order to to you know protect their profits and uh, to be able to to sell their product and continue to sell it. And you see the same thing with uh, with governments and militaries with their um, you know their 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 bot armies, right? Where oh. This person is saying something that goes against our, um, you know, our official government line. Well, we'll just throw a whole bunch of bots in the comment sections to tell them they're dumb and and that uh, this is the way it really is. And so you've got all these different different countries doing this from different sides of the, you know, of the with different arguments on different sides of the argument, and they're all kind of 
they're protecting their ground, the ground that they hold. And so it's almost like these are, well, so you could, you could use, I don't know how, um, I don't know how accurate this, this logic or this, this method of kind of inference would, would be, but you can say, okay, so, um, they're going after alternative health. So, okay, well, we can, we can guess at the very least that it's actually the drug companies that are doing this kind of thing because they've got this interest in doing it. And so you can kind of look at what ground they're trying to protect, what kind of existing power structure they're trying to preserve. And then you could go, you could look at each example, each kind of micro, uh, micro example to see, well, what might be going on here? So then you can look at, uh, um, at some aspects of cancel culture. So, I mean, you could make the argument that the, the people that the cancel culture is going after are encroaching on either the existing turf, um, you know, the acquired, the acquired territory or preventing the, the takeover of the, the territory that they would like to then conquer. So this is all part of, um, it's kind of like a, a military intelligence strategy to protect territory already held and to facilitate the acquisition of new territory. So a guy like Andy No prevents a group like Antifa from gaining, uh, gaining new territory. And in fact, his exposés can cause them to lose territory. You know, a, an alternative drug that can corner the, or that can take a, a huge chunk of the market from some over, you know, overpriced and less effective drug. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's seen as a, uh, a declaration of war by the pharmaceutical company. So then you, then we look at the examples that we were looking at beforehand and say, well, whose territory are we running up against when we talk about these things? And that's why the theosophers would say, Satan. well, it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's whose territory they're, they're coming after. So yeah. maybe. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say um, about the, uh, the the power thing. I mean, it's definitely like a huge part of the picture. I mean, to be sure. I mean, that's that's uh, uh, you know, I think it's absolutely right. You know, but you know, there there are some things you know that that maybe don't don't add up. I mean, um, the thing is, you know, like they it's weird. You know, <laughs> so let, let's say for example, uh, um, homeopathy. For a long time, that was actually in in Germany, for example, it was like uh, pretty accepted. So it was like even um, uh, uh, like you could get your money back from from state uh, health insurance and things like that. And uh, and then suddenly, it must have been like 10, 20 years ago, you know, it started to like uh, be attacked. And, uh, you know, I mean that you could say, OK, maybe it was just big pharma like trying to get that turf. Right. I mean, but what, why they, sh they hadn't done it before, you know, I don't know. Maybe they just weren't powerful enough, whatever, but you could make that argument. Right. They just, they just wanted to get it, you know, like that market. Um, and I'm sure that's part of it. I mean, there's no doubt. But then there's also the question, you know, the, um, the, the, the vitriol of these people who are doing the attacks. And I'm sure, you know, that there's probably some farmer like, PR shields, you know, but most of these guys on Wikipedia, they, they just really hate alternative health, you know, like it's, and the same with those NAFO trolls now, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, this is in part an intelligence operation and whatever, but I mean, they're genuine people who just absolutely, they can't stand it if anybody you know, says something like, oh, maybe we should open like negotiations, <laughs> some like crazy idea like that you know and they, they just freak out and uh and they, they're like gleefully like launching themselves into this uh, fight and uh i don't know it's it's kind of weird isn't it i mean it's, it's it's a strange phenomenon it's like this this obsession uh that oftentimes you know like isn't like they don't even have a financial interest or something you know it's like uh, it's as if like they you know they perceive this kind of like authority like this this official mind space and they feel like called upon to like protect it at, at all costs you know just for the sake of protecting authority you know like it's it's strange well it's like the <laughs> the guy that you had talked about in your article harrison who said he was uh attacking the um the guy because he wanted the the truth of science to shine through right it's 
it, that is, you know, an, a, a great example of what you were just talking about. Uh, and just something to throw in here that just like it reminded me of it uh, was how, like you were talking before about um, how all of these things change, all these different uh, ideas and values change. And like Harrison, you, uh, you had said something before that, um, well, now I can't remember exactly, but what I was going to bring up or wanted to bring up was uh, from, oh God, what was it? Oceania from 1984. Was that right? I think so, right? Oceania. Yeah. Where it's, no, we've always been at war with Oceania uh, and, and the, the memory holding and no things have, things have always been this way. You're just, you're not remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so that I, that ties into this somehow, and I'm, I'm still trying to work it out. Uh, uh, because the examples that you're, you're giving seems to have this element to it of rewriting history, but then it's just like a matter of, you know, what is this, what's the nature of that and where does it come from? And then how is it getting applied here? That's what I'm still kind of like working on, but I think it might have some kind of like cluster B personality disorder, uh, tie in there somewhere, but what were, I just what wanted were the, to throw it out there and see if anybody can. What were some of the examples you were thinking of, of the rewriting of history? Cause we brought up, for instance, you know, this, this example of this, this Jamie guy in the, in the, the marriage story, but what, what other examples do, do we have from like the, the cancel culture examples? Any? Um, well, uh, there was that one in particular. Um, but then there was also, um, I guess you might even say that, um, like with homeopathy, where the, all of a sudden these people come out and are attacking it vehemently. And it's like, no, we've always hated homeopathy. Um, even though like no one has said anything about it before, well, now it is something that is, I guess, retroactively seen as something that's always been uh, viewed in this negative light. Well, stories are really important, right? So narratives about how things really are, where they began, um, where they're going, uh, they, they structure our beliefs about reality. Um, and so I think uh, when, when, you, when you mess with the story, when you rewrite it, uh, getting back to the whole Russia analogy, when you when you tell the story of of why Russia is now in Ukraine, and you leave out eight years of, uh, you know, uh, Minsk II being ignored by the by the political powers of of Europe and the U.S. of all the agreements that were made, when you leave something out of that story or excise it completely. When you twist the story around, when you when you decide that uh, that that Ga uh, Gandhi, a statue of Gandhi, needs to be toppled, uh, because hey, we're we're toppling statues of uh, of you know Booker T. Washington and or, or any any historical figure who's made a contribution to Western civilization in a, in even a constructive way. When you when you destroy the story, when you denigrate it. When you uh, cease to acknowledge its positive uh, contribution to the way things are, um, you're, I think, trying to instill a new value into the minds of people and in yourself. It's a kind of a, um, it's a, it's a rewrite. It's a brainwash. It's a reprogramming. Uh, and so I think it. I think speaking to what you were talking about, Adam. Um, stories have incredible power to shape what we think in the moment about how things are. And, and when we erase history in some form, even by omission, uh, we, we try and, uh, accrue a type of power to ourselves that, that is, uh, that's really destructive. Part of that. And 
part of that, the stories that we tell ourselves are internal narratives, like Lobachevsky would call that the, uh, you know, substitution, selection and substitution of data. It's like, you've got, you've got the, your experiences, the facts that you're aware of, and then your, your kind of preferred way of looking at them. And in order to, in order to achieve the way you want to look at them, you might have to delete some things. You might have to replace some things with, with other things. And in order to be able to have that ideal story that you want to tell yourself, either about yourself or about others. So with, you know, with the Jamie example, he needed to, to rewrite his story so that he wasn't a, um, either a, a pervert or a hypocrite or, um, you know, not genuine in his, you know, in, in his net, in his new beliefs, he had to recreate that story in order to, to justify himself in the present. And you can see, and then there's the, the Orwellian use of it too. So the, you know, being memory hold or, or something like that, Oceania has always, has always been at war with East Asia. And then you see, I mean, what, what was the motivation for that? Well, that was primarily Stalinism. And so that's where you get the, you know, nowadays they're memes, but the, the pictures of Stalin with his cronies, right. And then they, they all start getting, they progressively get deleted from the pictures because, oh, well, he's a bad guy. We can't have a, ourselves admitting that, you know, great Stalin would associate him with himself with such a bad guy in the, in the past. We can't, uh, you know, acknowledge that we actually, um, propped this, this guy up who was obviously now, you know, a, a traitor and, and a, an evil demon. So we'll just, politely erase him from the, the historical record to, you know, to, to, to preserve our current, you know, understanding and our current, uh, you know, narrative that we're telling ourselves and that we're telling other people. And so it's kind of like a, a collective process and an individual process. And on the individual level, it's, um, <clears throat> it's just, the you know, there's a scale from, you know, everyone does it to one degree or another, and some do it a lot more than others. And, um, you know, it can approach, approach the level of like total delusion um in which case you know you you might get you know people that should be or are in you know uh psychiatrically institutionalized because they have no like no grasp on reality um but um but yeah we just have to we have to we have to be selective about what bits of information we allow to to, into our conscious minds, because if we if we let the wrong bit in, then it might cause too much of a disruption, and um, you know, cause us to to question the the things that we currently believe about ourselves and the and the world and stuff like that. You can't question the current thing, Harrison. <laughs> you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but it's a, it's an in, uh, interesting question. Uh, can we go too far? Right? I mean, you could also. I mean, like uh, flat Earth. <laughs> um, you can also um, like uh, you know like question everything until like your whole reality falls completely apart. Right? So, and it's not that you know just because it is kind of common sense something doesn't mean it's it's wrong. Right. I mean, just because, you know, most people believe something in society <clears throat> doesn't mean it's like the great beast, you know, like uh, <laughs> fooling you. So so that's uh, an interesting question that, that might bring us back to the mystics. Right. Because I think um, Ver Versluis, uh, he says in 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 one of his book, uh, uh, what was it that uh, you you guys all recommended? Um, the new position. No, the 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 one that we're Theosophia, yeah, the, Theosophia, right? Because I think he puts it very well. I just read the introduction uh, so far, but he says basically that something along the lines that the mystic, you know, it's or like your your connect your direct connection to the divine, so to say, is your only chance to, you know, like um, to get to the timeless, you know, and to kind of get out of this this matrix, this kind of like, um, uh, so societal, you know, like prison or like, how, however you want to call it. Um, and, uh, because th this, you know, like makes you kind of independent. So it doesn't mean you just because society says something, it's necessarily wrong, you know, but if you get that extra thing, then you can actually be, are in a position to judge, you know, and then you can say, okay, this, um, 
uh, this, you know, I accept, you know, this is common sense. Everyone accepts it, you know, and if I say something against it, nobody will, you know, like uh, react or anything, but it's still true, right? But this other thing, you know, it's also true. But if, you know, this is something that nobody thinks is true <laughs> and I actually get punished when I say this, you know, and so, um, yeah, I mean, maybe it's just, you know, the truth, but uh, it's it's actually, um, you know, like not so straightforward to, I mean, you can't argue, you know, you know, like if the mainstream media says two plus two is four, you know, then it's still four. And uh, and there are some people, you know, on the, uh, you know, on the conspiracy side, you know, like just go way too far, you know, with that and uh, just, um, you know, think the earth flat and whatever. Um, yeah. So, so maybe we need that kind of like, uh, co divine connection, or, or maybe you can even make a secular, you know, like argument, like for like truth, you know, it's maybe a bit harder to define, but if you get that, that inner connection to, you know, something wider, um, so that, that, that is needed, you know, to break, break out of this prison. So it's just, just a thought. I thought he, he put it quite beautifully in, in, in this introduction. And this might be something that kind of ties in with it. The giving everything its due and everything its purpose, then uh, we might could say that, you know, the beast, so to say, is kind of necessary. It, it We need this kind of like the society that keeps people within a fence so, to give people the barrier or the resistance they need in order to actually transcend it like they're actually have like maybe we really actually do need a pen in, in a sense in order to uh for some people to actually break out mm -hmm. yeah because if there's no fence then you can spend your life you know in the pasture and be like ah, oh, it's so beautiful and it's like and it's like oh why don't you go over there you know well it's it's just the same as it is here i'm fine here yeah. You know, but if someone puts up a fence and it's like, well, wait a second. Hmm. Yeah. I want to know what oh, the, yeah. what's, what's on the other, on the other side, side of that fence. fence. Why are you trying to keep me out of there? And then you kind of get up the, the, yeah. the curiosity to, to go on an adventure yeah. and to find out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we have anything else of pertinent insight into this? Really sprawling subject, as it turns out. Cancel culture being um, having more than one uh, level to it, for sure. Um, that might be one of the things to take away from this discussion, as far as uh, I could tell. Um, and if that's it, everyone, uh, good chat, guys. Lots to chew on there. And uh, But, well, just before we go, I just want to say... Um, that's, uh, I still do not think that we need is a great reset. I still do not agree. <laughs> but we need the great reset. We need it now. <laughs> I'm the German here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Adam, you're the usurper. Yeah, Adam, your, your German accent was way better than Luke's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what happened? It's it's because I eat the bugs every morning. <laughs> the great nutritional ah. value you cannot get with the animals. <laughs> okay, and that's it. We're cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> We've cancelled ourselves. Uh, and on that note, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we look forward to another show very soon. And until then, take good care. Keep aware. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. And uh, do your best. <laughs>